días a todos, bienvenidos. Hoy tenemos el gusto de tener con nosotros al profesor Tanés Aswat. Eh, como veis, eh, viene de la Universidad de, de Texas, en Arlington, pero durante este último año, como veis también, está haciendo una estancia a través de, de, una, de una beca Fulbright en, en Italia. Él, como veis de nuevo, pues ha trabajado en, en cosas muy distintas y muy diversas, desde el procesamiento y el comportamiento mecánico de materiales cerámicos, a ensayos y caracterización tecnológica, eh, materiales bioactivos, eh, materiales metálicos como el titanio, intermetálicos, etc. Eh, él es originario de India, pero hizo su máster y su tesis en Brown, y bueno, hoy le tenemos con nosotros, así que, welcome, thank, thank you very much thank for you. being here. And, well, sure that we are going to enjoy your talk. Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> When you want. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here, and I would like to thank also Professor Javier Lorca. Uh, known him for 20 years. It's been a long time since we met, but I'm very glad to be here again. Um, in the spirit of uh, the people who funded me to come to Italy and to come here as well, I thought I will give you a little bit of an introduction to the Fulbright program. And that's part of the reason why I am here today. And it's a very interesting program. Uh, traditionally, people used to think of Fulbright as a program for liberal arts, for people studying languages, history, culture, and so forth. But there are a significant number of uh, awards made for engineering majors as well. The Fulbright uh, program was started by William Fulbright, uh, who was a senator from the state of Arkansas. But the main goal is it's a bilateral program that is meant primarily to take individuals and use them as ambassadors for better understanding between cultures, as well as to increase the um, level of cooperation in all different areas, including science and technology between the United States and all the other countries in the world. It is not a program that is administered strictly by the United States, but it's a bilateral program, which means it is equal say from both the United States and the host country, uh, whether it be Spain, Italy, or, or any other country. Um, so what is Fulbright? Uh, it was started by William Fulbright, who um, actually was a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, Rhodes Scholars are exclusively for American citizens who end up going to Oxford University. And in fact, Bill Clinton, the former president, is also a Rhodes Scholar. Um, he was elected to the House of Representatives in 1942. And it's kind of interesting to see what the power of one individual can do. Because he was the guiding light behind establishing the Fulbright program. If he wasn't around, this program probably would not have happened. It started in the, right after the end of the Second World War in 1946. And the idea was after the war ended to try and find a way to increase international cooperation. And it was interesting to see the original funding for the Fulbright Commission came from the selling of surplus World War II equipment. And the money that came from that went to fund the Fulbright Commission. And the main goal is to binationalism, basically between the United States and individual countries. And um, com commissions, each country in the, in the world has a commission, which is uh, similar to what Spain has, has a Fulbright Commission. And just to give you an idea, a little bit of history on the Fulbright uh, Spanish Commission, and I think Professor Larco himself was a Fulbright fellow when I met him 20 years ago. Uh, established in 1958, uh, as of now, 4,000 Spanish people and 2,000 Americans have been awarded uh, Fulbright grants. And 50% of all Fulbright awardees are now university professors, or some of them are actually presidents of universities. So it's a very good track record for the commission to have. And the annual budget for the Fulbright Commission is $10.7 million, which is about eight or nine million euros. And what I didn't know is 75% of it actually comes from the Spanish government. So the United States is actually providing a very small amount of money. And 88% of the budget goes to pay for grants, only 12% is overhead. But more importantly, there are 160 grants. And the grants are for graduate students, 
postdocs and faculty. And in fact, more of the money is spent for graduate students. So if you're, you don't have to give up your parent degree, wherever you're getting your degree from, you'll still get your degree from here. But if there is a collaborative opportunity for you in the United States, it'll pay for you to go spend a year there. And it pays for all your expenses, a stipend and everything else. And then you come back here and finish up your degree. If you're a postdoc, you can finish a PhD in Spain and then go to the United States for a year or two and so forth. So there are lots of very good opportunities. They're always looking for good applicants. So if any of you are interested, this is the person you need to contact. I can, I know it's on the videotape as well, um, but uh, Patricia Zahinzer, and she's in the, it's in actually in Madrid, so she can help you with uh, uh, any of the paperwork and so forth and application process. Okay, that's a little bit of my spiel on the Fulbright Commission, and now we'll get to my talk. What I thought I will do also, I'll give you a little bit of a uh, broad overview of the things I do in addition to tribology. Um, I tried to do something fancy with this, but <laughs> it didn't show up very well here. But anyway, the title of my talk is Nanoscale Properties of In-Situ Form Tribofilms and Thermal Films. And a uh, number of people involved in this, primarily from uh, national labs and industry, some of who, whom are listed here. Uh, I do a lot of my work at uh, synchrotron facilities uh, at uh, Saskatoon and in uh, Wisconsin-Madison as well. But I'll just give you a broad overview of uh, what I work on in tribology. There are four broad areas in tribology that we work in. What I'll be talking about today is really fundamental aspects of tribology. A lot of the um, research that we do is funded by industry, so a lot of it is applied research. But, some, but the opportunity there is you have to be able to do a project and then carve out a little area in that to do fundamental science. The rest of it you need to still address the needs of who's funding you, which is industry. So fundamental studies in, in lubrication, and we have a mechanism in tribology and lubrication in a variety of uh, applications like gear oils, uh, greases, and uh, so forth. And the other two areas that I also work in is uh, development of environmentally friendly coatings. This is basically replacing chromate coatings for aluminum alloys. And high performance uh, anti-fouling paints which have a low environmental impact. But the main theme in most of what I do is trying to find environmentally friendly solutions for existing real world problems uh, which could be for example emission issues in automotive applications or uh, in the case of anti-fouling paint, it's basically what happens when uh, uh, paint leaches into the water and so forth. So this is one area, tribology and lubrication. Uh, I'm sorry, if I don't know why my slides are not showing up very well. But the other area that I work in is in biomaterials, drug delivery, and scaffolds for tissue engineering. Uh, this is kind of a broad area and it involves collaborative research with the people in the clinical side of things. So we, as material scientists, develop the materials, and the people who are clinicians are the ones who do the in vitro and in vivo work. So some of the in vitro work we do in our lab, but the in vivo work we do with uh, collaboration with people in the medical school. In this area, we do porous polymers for drug delivery, synthesis of biopolymers uh, from pus principles, polymer scaffolds for tissue engineering, and um, uh, three-dimensional micro-machine scaffolds for drug delivery applications and a little bit of area work in the area of bioceramics where we synthesize uh, uh, highly bioactive uh, ceramics such as um, silicate matrix ceramics which have uh, uh, phosphates embedded in them and also a little bit of work in polymer matrix composites. And the last area which is structural, that is my training, that's what I got my PhD in. So we, I still do a little bit of work in ceramic matrix composites by polymer pyrolysis uh, these are silicon oxycarbide, silicon oxycarbonitride matrices with uh, either um, um, oxide uh, fibers or uh, nickelon type fibers. And creep deformation, we look at uh, creep deformation in uh, application like solders and so forth, as well as in the past I worked in creep of uh, intermetallic alloys. And more recently, shape memory alloys uh, for uh, structural applications, uh, super elastic properties for um, uh, retrofitting bridges and so forth for earthquake prone areas. And my PhD area, which I still have a little bit of interest in, fatigue and fracture of uh, titanium based systems. 
Uh, I've just listed the people who work with me in the tribology area. I haven't listed the ones who work in the other areas. My, my primary co-worker in this is an organic chemist, uh, Ron Elsenbaumer. And as material science has evolved, it involves a multidisciplinary team of people working on things. There's a lot of chemistry, a lot of surface science, a lot of mechanical engineering and mechanical properties all tied together. So trying to work in a project like this, you have in, no one person can do everything. So we try to work a team together for that. Uh, in addition, uh, industry partners are essential because uh, the end uh, outcome of whatever we develop has to be applied in industry, otherwise they're not gonna fund us for this. So we have various different oil companies or industry partners and some of the facilities that we use for characterization can only be at large industrial facilities. So you have national lab uh, collaborators, including uh, Canadian Light Source and Synchrotron Radiation Center for our synchrotron work. And for engine uh, testing, we work with Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio. Uh, these are all the students who have since graduated and moved on to other things from my group. My group is a little small now because I'm away for seven months, so I graduated a number of students before I came. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of uh, what this presentation is about. I will start with the why. Why are we doing this? What is the driving force? And give you a little bit of an overview, a um, little bit of an overview, talk a little bit on the chemistry, and then tribological testing. The whole idea here is trying to understand starting chemistry and how starting chemistry influences what ha happens at a contacting surface and how what happens at a contacting surface develops uh, films which are formed in situ under tribological conditions and that are typically the first line of defense against catastrophic wear. This is a little different from um, hard coatings where you can do the coatings in a laboratory like PVD or CVD coatings and then apply it like diamond-like carbon or uh, titanium nitride and so forth are ex situ coatings. They're applied externally and they're up used in an application. In an engine application, the coatings are applied dynamically every time you change your oil in your car. And trying to change the morphology, the properties of those coatings based on the starting chemistry is really our goal and trying to tie those things together. So I'll talk about the why. Uh, of course, the most uh, important thing is improve efficiency of internal combustion engines. Uh, and for us, more recently, the bigger challenge has been reduce emissions and extend life of catalytic converters in your automobiles, reducing wear in engines, and lastly, another big goal is to prolong drain intervals in your car or your truck so that you don't have to take your car as often to change the oil in there. Uh, when I first saw this slide, it was quite surprising for me as well. If you look at the energy efficiency of an internal combustion engine, not very good. It's only about 12% useful energy of what calorific content you put into your uh, automobile in terms of gasoline, only about 12% is useful energy. A lot of energy is lost. Some of it is thermodynamic losses. You can improve that, of course, by increasing operating temperatures, but there are limits to that from materials considerations and lubrication considerations as well. So our interest is primarily in the area of uh, driveline losses and some mechanical losses, but primarily driveline losses where most of the energy is lost in terms of friction. So friction expends energy. So anything you can do to reduce friction can improve fuel economy. And the other aspect is, of course, emissions. Um, I'm sure any time you change the oil in your car, you never give it a second thought. You make sure you pay your 20 euros or 20, I don't know how much you pay for an oil change here, and they put some oil in your car and you're good to go for another 8,000 kilometers or something like that. But it's actually a very complicated uh, mixture of chemicals that are added. If anything goes out of balance, it will result in catastrophic wear in your engine. There are a number of things that are added in there. Uh, everything from detergent, dispersants, and antioxidants that keep your oil healthy and keep any wear debris that come dispersed. Then you have viscosity improvers, which are basically additives that are put in so that whether you're in Oslo or you're in southern Spain, you don't have to change the oil. The same oil will have comparable viscosity over a range of temperatures. And then, of course, you have things like rust inhibitors, friction modifiers, and foam represents. You don't want your engine frothing because of uh, uh, you know, all the uh, 
um, the mixing that goes on in the oil. But I will be talking primarily about anti-wear agents because they are probably, in my opinion, the most important agent because they protect your engine from wear. And um, I will go from the basics because I'm not sure how many of you have a chemistry background on this, but I'll spend a little bit of time on chemistry. The main anti-wear agent that is used in every engine oil across the world since the early 1930s is zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate. This is the structure, zinc. Um, you have dialkyl, this is this one, dithiophosphate. And the interesting chemistry here is it was originally used as an antioxidant, but when this molecule breaks down, this is the neutral form and this is a zinc oxide salt of it. When it breaks down, the phosphorus and sulfur, along with the zinc, form films on the surface, which are polyphosphate and have very high hardness and very good wear resistance. However, the presence of phosphorus and sulfur are the two main culprits in poisoning your catalytic converter. Gasoline has gotten cleaner and cleaner over time. You don't have a whole lot of sulfur in gasoline, so the primary source of sulfur and phosphorus in your engine comes from the additive that we need for anti-wear protection. When these uh, sulfur and phosphorus break down and end up in the uh, exhaust chain, they end up depositing on your catalytic converter and the available surface area for conversion either for reduction or for oxidation catalyst reduces. And the driving force for us comes in the United States where the Environmental Protection Agency is bringing in new legislation. They are kind of doing it at a back doorway. What they are saying is they are not saying you have to do this, 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 but they are saying automotive engine manufacturers have to guarantee that their automobiles that they sell will meet emission requirements like a new vehicle at 100,000 kilometers, which is a fairly stringent requirement. In your car is new, everything is wonderful. As it gets older, you start having problems in terms of emission. So putting the burden not on the consumer but on the manufacturer is driving the impetus because then the manufacturer has to deal with this problem one way or the other. Either spend a lot of money and replace the catalytic converter or try to work with people where we can develop new additives which are low in phosphorus and reduce this poisoning problem. So that's the why, that's the reason why we are working on this. And uh, for, for some time we couldn't publish some of the papers and that is one of the problems working with industry. The people who are funding us were a startup company and we were required to protect all the IP so that they could make money out of this eventually. So for the first three, four years we couldn't protect, uh, we couldn't publish and uh, Eventually, when the first group of PhD students are getting ready to finish, I told you, we cannot continue this way because students need publications. So at that time, we had uh, filed all our invention disclosures and we started publishing all our papers. But the idea here is uh, the zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate, or we have some new chemistry that we have developed, which is fluorinated version and some ashless diophosphates. And the idea here is you have the metal surface, which is the inside of your engine. And any of these additives are chemically absorbed and, uh, and trivochemically degraded with the resulting formation of a metalloid glass. A metalloid glass is nothing but a 100 to 200 nanometer thick glass that forms on all contacting parts in your engine and protects the surfaces. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, for those of you who are familiar with tribology, you know this is a typical Tribeck curve, which is friction versus Tribeck number. And without going through all the details, there are three different sections. You have full fluid lubrication, where you have large separation between contacting surfaces, where basically it's hydrodynamic lubrication. And in those areas, if you're looking at fuel economy, the only way you can improve fuel economy is to use a low viscosity oil because you're moving oil around and that takes energy. But we are more interested in boundary lubrication because 90% of the wear in your engine happens when you start your car because the oil is in the pan and not at the contacting surfaces. And secondly, when you accelerate and decelerate very rapidly, you have <coughs> very thin fluid film lubrication. So you have Friction coefficient goes up quite a bit. Your film thickness is very small. In this plot, in addition to the Strybeck number, I have this lambda here where H is the film thickness 
and R1 and R2 are the surface roughnesses of the two contacting surfaces. If that number is equal to one or less, you have asperity contact. When you have asperity contact, it's the chemistry in your oil that protects it, not the hydrodynamic, not the fluid flow, but it's the chemistry that breaks down and protects the surfaces. Um, I won't go through these equations. Uh, this is just to show the thickness of our films at um, under boundary lubrication are typically 20 to 35 nanometers and our surface roughnesses are typically in the range of micron. So our lambda value is well below one, which means we are at boundary lubrication conditions. So this tells, shows you a little schematic of how we run our experiments and how we go through the whole sequence. You have the breakdown of the uh, zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate and you form your polyphosphate class which are basically metal polyphosphates and in addition you have metal sulfides which is the constituents of your tribofilm. And if you use fluorinated ZDDP and I'll get to that in a little bit, you also create fluorinated hydrocarbons and a small monolayer of metal fluorides on the surface. And the way we know all this, we harvest wear debris in a wear test. We use transmission microscopy to characterize that and scanning electron microscopy. And on the wear surfaces, we do everything from Auger, XPS, nano indentation, and Zanes, which is X-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy to try and understand what's going on there. So it gives you a little bit of the overview, and I will quickly run through the chemistry because I know most of you are not chemists here, so but I'll just tell you a little bit of what took us several years to make these chemistries. Um, Again, as I mentioned, uh, the main additive that is forming films is zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate. However, you have to break it down. If it remains stable, no film forms. It remains in solution. So at the contacting site, you don't want it to break it down in the oil also. If it breaks down in the oil everywhere, it doesn't serve any good. It has to break down at the point where you want it to break down, which is surface contact, where local temperatures are very high. So this is a typical differential scanning calorimetric curve, and I'll just bring your attention to any one of these curves, which tells you the temperature at which you have an endotherm where when you heat something, it absorbs energy and, and decomposes. If you add a catalyst into the mix, you are pushing the decomposition temperature to a lower temperature. We were initially thinking of using a catalyst that will enhance the activity of an existing compound. And a definition of a catalyst is one that doesn't interfere with the reaction, but just accelerates the reaction. But it turns out, when you look at these little graphs here and compare it to this, you have many more curves, which suggest multiple reactions, both endotherms and exotherms, which gives you a clue that there is probably something new you're creating. So we had to understand what was happening so that you will study the decomposition profiles, and we don't look at the end products right now, but just the early intermediates, which are the ones that form on the surface, both when you have ZDDP and one with iron fluoride. And I will run through this real quick. There are ways in which you can fingerprint molecules. There are many techniques, one of which is phosphorus NMR. Uh, NMR is a very powerful technique by which you can look at the structure of different uh, chemicals. So for example, if you take ZDDP, the neutral ZDDP is this peak, and the basic ZDDP is the peak associated with this here. Plus, you have different thiophosphates that are used, which are ones that decompose first and form uh, films on the surface. Subsequently, you have the basic ZDDP, which decomposes next, and then neutral ZDDP. And the reason you have the sequence is when you put oil in your engine, you don't want your, all your additive to decompose the first 15 minutes. You want things to decompose slowly over time. So you take a mixture of different forms of this chemistry so that you can control the decomposition profile. If you bake this in nitrogen, for example, there are some short chain oligomers of uh, thiophosphate that form, which are precursors to the formation of uh, films. But when you are dealing with um, iron fluoride here, what you form is, in addition, you form short chain oligomers and this set of peaks that you see here, which are actually very interesting. This is 57 and 65 parts per million. I'll expand that a little bit. And without going too much into the detail, this is phosphorus NMR. When you decouple with hydrogen, the peaks that you get here 
are because of phosphorus and fluorine or phosphorus and phosphorus, you do not see the peaks with hydrogen. You decouple with hydrogen, you have a set of three peaks here, a set of three peaks here, there's a coupling concept of 1080. And then trying to isolate what you have, you take the same material, run a phosphorus enamor, decouple with fluorine, then it collapses, the same internal structure remains, phosphorus fluorine is suppressed, but then you end up with phosphorus, phosphorus, and phosphorus hydrogen. The way you can isolate what you have is then you run fluorine NMR and you again get the same coupling constant which indicates that your internal structure is a phosphorus fluorine bond. So this was our initial work where we were synthesizing this compound. We were actually putting fluorine into the backbone. So this is the structure where you replace, for example, one sulfur with a fluorine. But subsequently, we are now making our own chemicals, uh, ashless thiophosphate, but the Main goal is you have phosphorus fluorine, phosphorus sulfur, then these are different alcohols, um, different chain length. This is in fact C13, you have C18, C6 and so forth. All of that determines the decomposition temperature. The longer the chain, the more stable the material is. So the chemistry we are working with is with this fluorinated version. And the reason why we use fluorinated version is uh, in, when you're looking at tribology in an engine, it's a competition for surface. Everything wants to come to the surface. If the wrong thing comes to the surface, then you have no protection. For example, if your detergent comes to the surface and your dispersion comes to the surface and not your antiviral agent, you don't form a film. So when you're mixing these chemicals together, the fluorine that is present is very polar. When something which is very polar comes to a metal surface, it binds very fast. So that's one advantage of having fluorine in the backbone. The other aspect is when you're looking at engine oils again, over time, as if you don't change your oil in a, in a proper fashion, eventually when ZDDP decomposes, you have sludge formation. You know, you go to an oil chain and they took your filter out, you have a lot of gunk stuck in there. And that gunk is basically sludge, which is zinc and other chemicals. So there has been a drive to reduce the amount of that heavy metals in there and for that purpose, we are working with ashless materials. In this, in this case, you have zinc. In these cases, you do not have zinc. So one of the ways in which you can study uh, what happens is to do thermal films first. Thermal films is sort of a first principle study of what happens when you heat something up and what deposits on the surface. Once you understand that, then we can look at the tribological aspects. So let me talk a little bit about the tests and so forth. Uh, this is a typical home belt tribometer. We have several of these, several different kinds. So you have a contacting surface, a ball on a ring, and um, you have a vertical load applied, you have a scuffing ball, you have a load cell that measures friction force, and you also have, uh, uh, let me show you how the test is actually run. We run the test a little differently. This is the contacting surface, this is the ball, and this is the cylinder. You put a very small amount of oil, about 50 microliters. 50 microliters is one large drop of oil. The reason we do it that way is by controlling the way we run the test and the oil that we put in. We control the chemistry that goes in there. Then we can harvest the oil, we can harvest the ring, and we can study everything that goes on. So for example, in a typical test, you can also have a thermocouple embedded in there very close, so you can measure not contact temperature, but near contact temperature. So if you look at friction versus number of cycles, when you first start the test, and for that matter, when you have uh, an automobile and you're changing the oil out, uh, when you change the oil out, it's not that big a deal because you already have a film on the, on the engine present. But if you are a brand new car and in the factory, they are putting the first fill of oil. When you first start your engine, your friction is very high because you have metal on metal contact. It takes a short period of time and a lot of abrasive wear before a film forms. Once a film forms, your friction coefficient is stable. It does not increase. And this is what you would like to see for the whole test. And if you look at con near contact temperature, the temperature remains more or less constant. It's only when the films start breaking down, friction goes up, temperature goes up, and you have catastrophic wear. So if you run some experiments and follow this very carefully, what you find is, in this whole region where you have good tribofilm formation, there is almost zero wear. 
you look at the wear profile, they look identical. It's only when you, your film breaks down and you have uh, what you call stick-slip behavior, where the film breaks down, you have welding, literally welding of the surfaces, but then it tears off. New film forms, the friction drops, and that film strips off, and then that's why you're seeing this going back and forth, but that results in a large amount of wear. But what you really want is to stay in this region. I won't show you a lot of wear data. I'll just show you ZDDP, which is the current state of the art, and what we consider the fluorinated ZDDP, which we are uh, developing in our laboratory. And if you look at the wear, it's about 50% below that. So um, that has been our big selling point in trying to develop chemistry that is significantly better from a wear point of view. And uh, when you look at the wear of ZDDP and ashless anti-wear agents, this is a neutral dialkyl dithiophosphate, which has a relatively low decomposition temperature. When you have a low decomposition temperature, the film breaks down relatively quickly. So you have a lot of wear associated with that. On the other hand, if you have an ashless dialkyl dithiophosphate, which is more stable, doesn't break down that easily, your wear is very low, and you compare it to ZDDP, the advantage here is the wear is even lower than ZDDP, and you don't have any heavy metals present in there. So in trying to understand, now that we have shown some wear data, we now try to understand chemically what goes on. So we'll start with thermal films from ZDDP and uh, two different uh, ashless dialkyl dithiophosphate. Uh, you can't see anything, so I apologize. Uh, usually it works out, but <laughs> uh, anyway, you can see the numbers. <laughs> you, don't, you can trust me, the numbers are there, <laughs> but the films are, well, I can turn this around for you, and uh, you can see this screen. On the screen, it's better <laughs> than what I said. Uh, what we are doing here is trying to follow the growth of thermal films. And the growth of thermal films starting from zero time all the way to about uh, four hours, and we run this at very high temperatures. The temperatures we've chosen is 160 degrees C, and uh, 160 degrees C is typical of uh, the temperature in the internal combustion engine. Uh, though the actual contact temperature is a little bit higher. I guess not, yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay, that's much better, thank you. <laughs> okay, yes. So you can see the growth of the thermal films here from very thin to thicker, but the kinetics also follow a certain pattern. The chemistry that has a relatively low decomposition temperature forms a film very rapidly and then no further growth. But what you, this data doesn't tell you is the reconstitution of the chemistry of the film. The chemistry of the film is as important as the thickness of the film. In the case of the ashless material, you see that the film continues to grow uh, over time. Uh, I'll pass on this one. And so I'll give you a little bit of a primer on X-ray absorption near its spectroscopy, which is a very, very nice surface uh, characterization tool. Uh, this is unfortunately not something you can have in your laboratory. This is only in central synchrotron facilities. Uh, what we do in this is we are taking a beam of photons and we have monochromators that will control the energy of the incoming photon. And the photons come and hit your sample. And they hit the sample. Primarily what we try to do is we get close to the absorption edge. And the absorption edge is, for example, if you look at the K edge, that's the energy it takes to remove an electron from the core shell and put it to a high energy level. The L shell is for the second orbital electron. But what is interesting is the energy of these electrons is perturbed by its neighborhood. The surrounding atoms that are around that atom will determine very, very clearly what the different absorption edges and absorption peaks are there associated with that. So it's almost like a fingerprint. You can determine what element is surrounding a given element, whether that element is in an octahedral position, a tetrahedral position, is it um, what the bond lengths are, everything else can be determined. And it's also very surface sensitive. The LH 
the total electron yield gives you information from the top five nanometers. The fl fluorescent yield in the LH, which is the second orbital from, this, from the center, gives you information from the 50 nanometers. The KH, which is the core shell, which is higher energy to push out, gives you information from deeper down, all the way down to about a few microns. Because now we are really interested in what happens at the surface and through thickness of the surface. Okay, um, there are two ranges. You have the X-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy and the extended X-ray absorption fine edge. And the difference between the two is uh, most of what we do is Zanes, which is, let me go back, uh, Zanes is in the near edge region. So there's a pre-edge and then the Zanes region. Each of these little peaks it tells a little bit of a story there. Um, so much information, chemical information can be extracted from Zane, for example, the valency. If you have an element with two different valencies, they have two different absorption edges. Coordination environment, for example, if you are looking at cations, most of the time you're looking at cations, whether those cations in a ceramic or in a metalloid glass are in octahedral or tetrahedral coordinations, you can pick that up. And geometrical distortions in the structure also will give that information. On the other hand, the extended uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy gives you more information on bond lengths. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but that is actually very useful if your interatomic bond lengths change because of local perturbation in the structure, we can pick that up as well. So for example, this is a fingerprinting technique. So what we do is uh, we acquire as many model compounds or we make model compounds and get those spectra for those model compounds. So for example, I'll just show you a few examples of how you can differentiate very easily. Here are some phosphorus cage spectra. This is iron phosphate and zinc phosphate. Uh, we are looking at the phosphorus edge. You can see, for example, you have a pre-edge associated in the iron phosphate, which is not present in zinc phosphate, and the peak positions are about, two, about 1 to 2 EV apart. So you can, if you have zinc phosphate versus iron phosphate, we can distinguish that. The other thing is, for example, sulfites versus sulfates. Uh, you can, the sulfates are all here, the sulfites are all here. So there are about 5 EV different, 5 to 10 EV different. So you can distinguish very well from a chemistry point of view. So for example, uh, what we do for thermal films in trying to understand uh, the kinetics of the film growth, you look at the spectra and, sorry, and then you deconvolute the spectra, get the area under this, and then you can quantify this data. And you can also separate between sulfate peaks and sulfide peaks very well. And you can also distinguish, for example, the relative proportion of phosphorus and sulfur species in your film. So this is um, the KH, phosphorus spectrum, sulfur spectrum. You have to remove the background and then you can deconvolute these things and extend that data. Um, there's a lot of data here. I won't uh, spend too much time on it other than to make a point to suggest that in the case of zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate, you have a very high sulfur to phosphorus ratio. And in addition, one of the important things is in tribology, particularly in an engine application, sulfates are not good. They're more abrasive. Sulfides <coughs> are softer. So if you want lubricity, you want sulfides present, not sulfates. So if you look at thermal films, you can clearly see when you start off, you have oxidation. When you first deposit, you have a plenty of oxygen present, so it's all sulfate. Over time, you have sulfides forming, but over longer periods of time, your sulfides decompose and give you sulfates, so those numbers start dropping down again. So th this, for example, also, sorry, uh, this also shows you that you have a lot more sulfur than phosphorus when you have ZDDP. On the other hand, the ashless diophosphate, which is less stable, tends to decompose very rapidly. And then over time, you will see that the, there is a reconstitution of your films to have <coughs> higher phosphorus levels. But unfortunately, in this case, the ones that decompose quickly, you have a lot more sulfate. So it's not very attractive from a tribological point of view. On the other hand, when you have the more stable diophosphate, you will see that the kinetics are shifted to the right a little bit. And secondly, you have a lot more phosphorus. The phosphorus is very important for film formation. So having a higher phosphorus content at the end at four hours is much more attractive in this particular case. 
So this gives you a little bit of information. The other piece of information that is important is also to extract from this, are you working with just short chain phosphate or are you polymerizing the film on the surface? And again, Zinc comes in very handy. For example, this is a series of spectra for different zinc compounds uh, of increasing, um, um, maybe. in fact, this is zinc phosphate and these are all different uh, chain, uh, chain length of zinc phosphate compounds. But what we can do is we can take the peak ratio of A to C and if that ratio is less than 0.3, it's short chain polyphosphate. If it's longer than 0.6, it's long chain polyphosphate. What you want is long chain polymerized polyphosphate which form a glass. If it's short chain, it doesn't form a glass. To date, nobody had actually shown the formation of long chain polyphosphates under thermal conditions, but what we have shown is, um, in fact, this is just calibration curve. What we have shown is that it is possible in the case of ZDDP after 10 minutes to form medium chain, uh, short to medium chain polyphosphate compounds, but more importantly, in the new chemistry that we have developed, ashless um, dialkyl dithiophosphate, you form relatively medium to long chain polyphosphate compounds even under thermal conditions which tells us that it is possibly one of the reasons why we have good wear results. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what happens when you do thermal films. So we'll get to tribal films. Tribal films is really where the proof is in the pudding because that's what you're looking at at contacting surfaces. And what I will do is I'll go through it in a sequential fashion to build a material model. Uh, you can do this from first principles from molecular dynamic simulations or we can do it chemically the way we do it by trying to understand every little aspect that happens and then tie everything together to come up with a material model to explain exactly what happens at the structure. So there are multiple different techniques one has to use. For example, the well-known technique you can use SEM. It doesn't give you a lot of information. It just tells you that the surface morphology of the tribofilm is patchy. You have large wear out, you know, pull out and regions where you have no film present. But chemically, it just tells you you have, it's not very surface sensitive, it tells you have phosphorus, sulfur, and so forth. And you do a fluorinated version, the film is more stable, less pull out, you still have the same chemistry on the surface. So from this piece of information, all I can tell you, you have phosphorus, sulfur, zinc, and the surface roughness of the film is higher when you have ZDDP, it's a little smoother when I have fluorinated ZDDP. So the next thing I do is try to understand, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention we have fluorine as well in this case, no fluorine in this case. Then what you can do is you can look at the counter surface. You have the tribological surface and then you have the counter surface. The counter surface we use a tungsten carbide ball on which the tribofilm is actually transferred on there and we can analyze the tribofilm there. <clears throat> and here because you don't have the large iron substrate, the iron peak is relatively small. The peak here that you see from iron is coming from the tribofilm. And you have a little bit of zinc, but you have higher phosphorus. I'm sorry, this is a ZDDP. You have higher sulfur than phosphorus in the transfer layer. If you take the same case for the uh, fluorinated ZDDP, you have about same amount of phosphorus and sulfur and a uh, little bit uh, smaller amount of iron in this particular case. The next thing you want to do is actually physically measure the tribofilm and for which we use focused ion beam. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, a focused ion beam is basically a beam of gallium ions that we take and we use it like a butter knife, literally. It just cuts through the film and then we use a secondary electron detector and you can physically measure the thickness of the film and you can see here this is the tribofilm, which is very smooth, good surface of the film. And we have actually taken a beam of gallium ions and cut. And this is the steel substrate and this is the film. It's 100 nanometers thick when you have uh, ZDDP. It's about 180 nanometers thick when you have uh, fluorinated ZDDP. The other thing we then do is in a tribological test, at the end of the test or at any stage of the test, we can harvest a little bit of the oil, we put it on a copper grit with a polymer film, we wash it, and then we can look at the wear debris in a transmission microscope. So for example, at different stages of the test, 
we can harvest material. This is in the early stage of the test, so this material peeling out is largely intact tribofilm. So what you see here, this is a large batch. This is a, this scale here is about 200 nanometers, so this is almost a micro, several microns in size. And as the test progresses, the film starts breaking down and it starts getting worn and ground together and the, and the particle sizes decrease and as you get to the end of the test, you have basically created very fine 200, na about 200 nanometer sized debris particles. But what we are more interested in is the constitution of this debris. For which purpose we can use EDS and uh, selected area diffraction. If we start with EDS, for example, in the case of ZDDP, you have more sulfur than phosphorus, which is again consistent with what we did earlier. And in the case of fluorinated ZDDP, you have more phosphorus than sulfur. And then we can do the TEM of these things as well. And the next slide shows you in more detail. The TEM suggests that the tribofilms that have come off are ones that were present on the surface that have come off are actually amorphous metalloid films. But embedded within these are these little black spots. And these little black spots are 20 nanometers in diameter. It doesn't matter how many you have. They tend to be self-consistent. They grow to 20 nanometers and stop. And if you analyze the ring patterns, you find that these spots that you see here are Fe304. If you had very severe wear, you would have actually seen Fe203, which is extremely abrasive. However, there is a correlation between the number of these particles and the extent of wear. Because even though Fe304 is not as abrasive, it is still abrasive. In the fluorinated case, you find that you have m much fewer density of these particles, and that is also evident from this pattern. If you look closely here, you can see very clearly defined ring patterns, whereas here it's much more diffused, and you can do a calculation on the number of particles here, fewer particles here. So again, what this is telling us is when you're using fluorinated chemistry, it tends to give you better wear resistance, and we're trying to understand why that is. And one of the reasons is that the film doesn't oxidize as easily, it's more stable. So with this information, we are building up a little more of our database. If you notice, I've put all these elements here, I have not linked anything together. My film is thicker in the case of fluorinated DDP, it's thinner here, more uh, pull out and more abraded in the case of, uh, case of ZDDP. And you have more sulfur here and more phosphorus here in this case. So that much information we have. And this is thicker, 200 nanometers, 100 nanometers. The next thing we can do is we can do uh, XPS and Auger electron spectroscopy, which are surface techniques. And we do depth profiling. Depth profiling is basically a process in which you get a spectrum, an elemental spectrum, which also tells you the binding energy of the elements. And then you use an argon beam, you sputter the surface, you get another spectrum, and you do that over and over and over again. So you chemically, you know what is there from the surface going down. So we do that in multiple locations. This is the tribal track. There are two points in the tribal track, one outside, same thing in the fluorinated CDDP as well. And there are a few pieces of information. I'm not gonna spend time on all of it. The main thing is that the film thickness here is in the case of fluorinated CDDP is thicker than in the case of CDDP. This case is a slightly different condition. We also have an antioxidant, which is an alkylated diphenylamine that was added. Uh, if you're looking at thermal film in this case, there's practically nothing there. So under tribological conditions, the film forms under tribological condition and it tends to grow. And you have thicker films when you have fluorinated ZDDP. So with this information, I didn't go through the details, but when you do the Auger, it tells you what type of film you have also. You have a thin organic film on the top, and then you have your tribal film below that. The next thing we would do is try to understand the mechanical properties of this, because that is what determines tribological behavior. <coughs> we do nano indentation and nano wear, and uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with nano indentation. It's a typical indentation test. Uh, load, hold, unload, and you extract modulus and hardness in the unloading part. And this is a typical uh, Oliver Farr equation for extracting 
uh, reduce modulus and then based on the depth of penetration you get the hardness. Um, let me spend a few minutes on this. Uh, this is quite interesting because when we run the test under extreme condition boundary lubrication, the films that are formed are very hard on the surface. The hardness of your steel is about 8 gigapascals. So the, so the film that forms is about 20 gigapascals. That's very, very hard. And then as you go deeper into the film, it's equivalent to the hardness of the steel. But when you look at the reduced modulus, you see something different that happens. You look at ZDDP, because the film is thinner, you end up with um, substrate properties coming into play relatively quickly with, before you get about 50 nanometers. But in the case of fluorinated ZDDP, which has thick films, what you find here is you have very high stiffness, very high hardness, which is good for wear resistance. But underneath, you have something that has much higher compliance. If you look at the stiffness here, it's about 100 gigapascals, which is half that of steel. So you have a very hard surface and a compliant region underneath. It's like a spring, in a sense. Hard, abrasive, resistant surface, and uh, more compliant region underneath. And the other thing we can also look at is look at, take the diamond tip and try to see if you can abrade the surface. And because that's essentially what's happening in the tribological contact. Wear debris gets wedged between two surfaces, and as the surfaces are moving, the wear debris tries to rip things off. So we are doing the same thing using a diamond tip. So, for example, you use a cube, uh, not cube, I'm sorry, cone indenter, because the shape is very, very critical. A cone indenter is spherically symmetrical. Uh, if you use a typical Berkowitz tip, you end up with all kinds of weird data. With the cone indenter, it, it gives you very nice wear uh, profiles. And so what you do here is you take the tip and you go back and forth on your wear surface. And this is 75 micronewtons. And um, you run the test. And then you look at the amount of material that is removed. The less material removed, the better off you are. So in the case of fluorinated ZDDP, you have much smaller amount of wear compared to the zinc dialkyl diethylphosphate. So with all of this, you're building more of your material model. You have, uh, sorry, the thickness. You have properties like hardness and, everything, and modulus uh, figured out and compared with ZDDP and fluorinated ZDDP. But I haven't linked those elements still together. That's where uh, X-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy comes in. Um, I know with want of time, I won't go through all of the details, but. You can trust me when I tell you we spent a lot of time analyzing the spectra, and you can tell based on peak position and shape of the peaks and so forth exactly what element is linked with what. For example, in the case of um, using the phosphorus L edge, you can tell that there is a mixture of short chain zinc phosphate and iron phosphate with uh, fluorinated ZDDP exhibiting a stronger amount of zinc phosphate. You can do the same thing with um, the k edge, and you can do the same thing with sulfur, and you can do this with sulfur k edge, oxygen and iron, iron L edge, zinc L edge. So each element, what we are doing is we are taking each element and looking at its neighborhood. And based on that understanding, we can tie everything up together. And this is oxygen k edge. And we also do some XPS to pinpoint fluorine. Fluorine is a little tricky because fluorine tends to be impossible to see in OJ. You can see that on XPS because they have spatial discrimination. And on zanes, unfortunately, fluorine, with the beam being as high energy as it is, it vaporizes the fluorine very quickly. So we have to use XPS for this. So with all of this, we come finally to a material model to explain, based on our starting chemistry, what we end up with, what is linked with what, what forms on the surface, and how it is bound to the surface. So this is the typical tribofilm when you have zinc dialkyl diethylphosphate. You have iron oxide, which is Fe3O4. But in addition, you have, for example, uh, this is sulfur bound with uh, zinc, zinc sulfide. And you also have, in this particular case, this is oxygen, and these are um, sorry, this is oxygen, and this is a case of, um, um, pardon me, colors, yeah, phosphate. This is a phosphate. So that's a zinc phosphate or an iron phosphate that you have there. And similarly, you have sulfates that form. Uh, this is, in, the, in this particular case, it's a sulfate. So you can have different proportion of these different elements that are combined in a tribofilm. 
In the case of a fluorinated one, it's networked. You can see everything is linked together. And you also have a smaller proportion of iron oxide. And with all of this information, you can basically come up with a, a phenomenological model where we can show that uh, uh, fluorine is linked. Okay, fluorine is linked to the metal surface, and that helps bind the tribofilm together. And all of the different chemistries that are present in the tribofilm. And lastly, based on all of the data that we got, we can come to a conclusion on how the film forms, the chemistry of the film, the relationship of the chemistry of the film to the starting chemistry that we worked with. So the general idea in these type of uh, projects is to tweak the starting chemistry. That's where um, my colleague and I, we try to work with uh, uh, starting building blocks of molecules and make new chemistry. And then we have tried a number of things that have failed what you get to see are things that work. And typically, when you're working with these type of chemistry, I would say one in 15 molecules actually works. So you end up spending a lot of time on things that don't work. And then when something works, then we spend all this extra time from a material science point of view in trying to understand why it works. And then with that, we are able to develop a phenomenological model to explain the relationship between starting chemistry and final surface uh, chemistry and surface properties. So with that, I'll just <coughs> Thank you very much for this night talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. Yes. First of all, I'm interested by you for your great presentation. Sure. I have a couple of doubts. Yeah. Uh, the first one is this, why, why are you using the same, you know, that's, it's because I have more selectivity with the ion substrate, uh, but as you showed, the links are in between the sulfur and the oxygen between mm -hmm. the substrate. So yes. it can be substituted by sure. the other one. The, the links which have sulfur to oxygen is not beneficial. That's the sulfates that usually form. So when you use ZDDP or fluorinated ZDDP, there's sufficient number of links that form with iron and sulfur and zinc and sulfur which is lubricious. But however, our data that we have uh, clearly suggests that there is some amount of sulfates that form as well. And one of the things I'd like to bring attention to also, we pushed our tribological condition to a slightly more on the severe side. And because we were trying to push boundary lubrication. If you take typical mixed lubrication where the conditions are not as severe, then you have a smaller proportion of sulfates and more of sulfites. So when you take, for example, um, in your automobile itself, the times when you have the severe lubrication are probably less than 1% of your driving time. 99% of your driving time, you have no wear that occurs in your engine. So you're, we were only interested in that 1% of the time and how chemistry can affect that. And that's part of the reason why we have more sulfur oxygen linkages in our case. However, that sulfur oxygen linkages are smaller when we use some of the new chemistries compared to the traditional ones. I don't know if I answered your question, but. but I mean, there is no chance to replace by any other metal? No. Ah, other metal. Um, antimony is one, which is, from an environmental point of view, even worse than zinc. The ideal case, because what zinc does is it it's a cationic species that helps in the cross-linking of the phosphate network. So you need some cations. If you don't have a cationic species, you cannot form a well-networked metalloid glass. So for example, when you're working with ashless material, there is no metal cation in that case. So you have to have a little bit of wear and the iron from the substrate itself serves the purpose. It turns out zinc is quite an efficient element for forming these networks. But there are other ones, certainly. You can use antimony and uh, people have used copper in some cases. However, the reason why copper is not used is, particularly for engine applications, is you use copper in bearings. And so if you add copper in your additive, you don't know where the source of copper is when you do a forensic test of your oil. Uh, they typically for uh, automobile engines as well as aircraft engines, aircraft engines in particular, 
every 100 hours they take a little amount of oil from your engine and they send it for forensic analysis where they look at iron content, copper content, nickel content. You know exactly where the copper is, you know exactly where the nickel is in your engine. So if your nickel spikes or your copper spikes, you know that you have bearing problems or something like that. So a number of the elements that you normally would use are excluded because they're part of the engine structure, like chromium and so forth, and they will always be present. And you will now not have an idea whether it's coming from your additive or you're coming from some. That's why zinc is used, because zinc is not used in any uh, part in your engine. Right? And another question is, that do we need the tribal film for to be porous? Or With what? The tribal film, do we need to be porous or not? No. We, um, for better efficiency? Or? It is patchy. I, I wouldn't call it porous. The, the film where it forms is actually very dense, but it is not necessarily continuous. It would be nice if it could be perfectly continuous, but a engine is a living, breathing thing. It is constantly under tribological contact. There's debris coming, pulling stuff off from the surface. So the film, in principle, can form continuously. But because you have debris and you have contacting surfaces and asperities that are dragging along, you have stuff pulled out. So it is not porous, but there is abrasion on the surface. But the film in itself is compact and very dense. Um, I have not known of anything where you can actually make a porous film. Um, but I'm guessing you could, uh, if you have some engineered surface, you could do that. But in this application, no. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Okay.